Chapter 18 of Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. There were four motors to pull the big plane through the air, and their roaring was a vast thundering noise which the earth re echoed. But inside the cabin, the tumult was reduced to a not intolerable humming sound. What'll I do with this devil, Bell? asked Jameson. Now that we're aloft, I confess this grenade makes me nervous. I'm holding it so tightly my fingers are getting cramped. Tie him up, said Bell, without looking. He'll talk presently. Movements. The plane flew on, swaying slightly in the way of big seaplanes everywhere. A willy wall began in the hills ahead and swept out and set the ship to reeling crazily in its erratic currents. The strait vanished and they were tumbled hills below them. Minutes passed. Got him fixed up, said Jameson coolly. I'll guarantee he won't break loose. Got any plans, Bell? No time, said Bell. I haven't had time to make any. The first thing is to get where his folk will never find us. Then we'll see what we can do with him. Paula looked at the now-bound figure of the master, and the little old man beamed at her. He's, he's smiling, said Paula, in a voice that was full of peculiar, horrified shock. Bell shrugged. Punta Arenas was all of twenty-five miles behind, and the earth over which they flew began to take on the shape of an island. Water appeared beyond it and innumerable small islands. Bell began to rack his brain for the infinitesimal scraps of knowledge he had about this section of the world. It was pitifully scanty. Punta Arenas was the southernmost point of the continental mass. All about it was an archipelago and a maze of waterways, thinly inhabited everywhere, and largely without any inhabitants at all. The only solid ground between Cape Horn and the Antarctic ice pack was Diego Ramirez and the South Shetlands. Nothing to go on. But any sufficiently isolated and desolate spot would do. Almost anywhere along the southern edge of the continental islands should serve. The plane roared on monotonously, while Bell began to wrestle with another and more serious problem. In three days, two now, an American naval vessel would turn up with scientists and chemists on board. It was to be doubted whether anything like an overt act would be risked by that vessel. If all the governments of South America were under the master's thumb, then cabled orders from his deputies would race three navies to the spot, and the government of the United States does not like to start war anywhere. Certainly it would not be willing to enter into a conflict with the whole southern continent for the solution of a problem that so far affected that continent alone. The master's kidnapping had solved nothing so far. Jameson tapped his shoulder. No pursuit so far, he observed coolly. I've looked. Bell nodded. They don't dare. Not yet, anyhow. They're depending on the master. How is he? Smiling peacefully to himself, damn him, snarled Jameson. Do you know what we're up against? Ourselves, said Bell coldly. But I'm nearly licked. He's got to talk. Jameson moved away again. The earth below looked as if it had been torn to shreds in some titanic convulsion of ages past. The sea was everywhere, and so was land. There were little threads of silver interlacing and crossing and wavering erratically in every conceivable direction. And there were specks of islands, rocks only yards in extent, and islands of every imaginable size and shape with their surfaces in every possible state of upheaval and distortion. A broader mass of land appeared ahead and to the left. Tierra del Fugo again, muttered Bell, if we cross it. For fifteen minutes the plane thundered across the desolate rocky hills, then the maze of islets again. Bell scanned them keenly and saw a tiny steamer traveling smokily for no conceivable reason among the scattered bits of stone. The sea appeared, stretching out toward infinity. Bell rose to survey a wider space. 
He swung to the left so that he was heading nearly southeast and went on down toward the desolation of desolations, the stormy cape which faces the eternal ice of the Antarctic. He was 5,000 feet up then and scanning sea and earth and sky. And suddenly he swung sharply to the right and headed out toward the open sea. He felt a small figure pressing against his shoulder. Presently, fingers closed tightly upon his sleeve. He glanced down at Paula and managed to smile. There are some rocks out there, he told her quietly. Islands, I think. And Diego Ramirez at a guess. They were specks, no more, but they were vastly more distinct from the plain than from Mount Beaufoy. That is on Henderson Island, in New Year's Sound, and its 1,700-foot peak was almost below Bell when he sighted the islands, but the islands have been seen fully 50 miles from there. It took the plane nearly 40 minutes to cover the space, but long before that the islands had become distinct. Two tiny groups of scattered rocks, the whole group hardly five miles in length, and by far the greater number no more than boulders surrounded by sheets of foam from breakers. Two of them merited the name of islands. The nearest was high and bare and precipitous. No trace of vegetation showed upon it. The farther was smaller, and at its northern corner a little cove showed, nearly landlocked. Bell descended steeply. The big plane plunged wildly in the air eddies about the taller island at five hundred feet, but steadied and went winging down lower and lower. The waves between the two islands were not high, but the seaplane alighted with a mighty, a tremendous splashing, and Bell navigated it grimly, though clumsily, into the mouth of the cove. There a small beach showed. He went very slowly toward it. Presently he swung abruptly about, a wingtip float grounded close to the shore. The motors cut off and left a thunderous silence. Bell climbed atop the cabin and let go the anchor. We're here, he said shortly. Bring the master and we'll go ashore. The catwalk painted on the lower wing guided them. Bell jumped to the rocks first and stumbled, and then rose to lift Paula down and take the master's small, frail body from Jameson's arms. "'You've looked for a gun?' asked Bell. "'He had nothing to fight with,' said Jamison heavily. He had been facing the same problem Bell had worked on desperately and had found no answer. But he shuddered a little as he looked about the island. There was nothing in sight but rock. No moss, no lichens, not even stringy grass or the toughy scrub bushes that seemed able to grow anywhere. Bell untied the master carefully, but without solicitude. The little man sat up and brushed himself off carefully and arranged himself in a comfortable position. I am an old man, said the master in mild reproach. You might at least have given me a cushion to sit upon. Bell sat down and lighted a cigarette with fingers that did not tremble in the least. Suppose, he said heartily, you talk. First, of what your poison is made. Second, of what the antidote is made. Third, how we may be sure you tell the truth. The master looked at him with bright, shrewd, and apparently kindly old eyes. Heo mio, he said mildly. I am an old man, but I am obstinate. I will tell you nothing. Bell's eyes glowed coldly. Does it occur to you, he asked grimly, that it's too important a matter for us to have any scruples about, that we can and will make you talk? You may kill me, said the master benignly, but that is all. And, Bell said more grimly, we have only to get back in the plane yonder and go away. The master beamed at him. Presently, he began to laugh softly. Heo mio, he said gently, let us stop this little byplay. You will take me back in my airplane, and you will land me at Punta Arenas, and then you will fly away. I concede your freedom, but that is all. You cannot leave me here. Paula, said Bell coldly, get in the plane again. Jameson. 
Paula rose doubtfully. Jameson stood up. The master continued to chuckle amiably. You see, he said cherubically, you happen to be a gentleman. Senor Bell, every man has some weakness. That is yours. And you will not leave me here to die, because you have killed my nephew, who was the only other man who knew how to prepare my little medicine. And you know, senor, that all my subjects will wish to die. Those who do, in fact, he added mildly, will be fortunate. The effect of my little medicine does not make for happiness without its antidote. Bell's hands clenched. You know, said the master comfortably, that there are many thousands of people whose hands will writhe very soon. The city of Punta Arenas will be turned into a snarling place of maniacs within a very little while, if I do not return. Would you like, senor, to think in after days of that pleasant city, filled with men and women tearing each other like beasts, of little children even, crouching and crushing and rendering the tender flesh of other little children, of lisping little ones gone. Stop, snarled Bell in a frenzy. Damn your soul, you're right. I can't. You win so far. Always, said the master benevolently, I win always. And you forget, senor, you have seen the worst side of my rule. The revolutions, the rebellions, that have made men free. Were they pretty things to watch? Always, amigo, the worst comes. But when my rule is secure, then you shall see. He waved a soft, beautifully formed hand. From every possible aspect, the situation was a contradiction of all reason. The bare, black, salt-encrusted rocks, with no trace of vegetation showing, the gray water rumbling and surging among the uneven rocks at the base of the shore, while gulls screamed hoarsely overhead. The white-haired little man with his benevolent face, smiling confidently at the two grim men. The time will come, said the master gently, and in the tone of utter confidence with which one states an inescapable fact. The time will come when all the earth will know my rule. The taking of my little medicine will be as commonplace a thing as the smoking of tobacco, which I abhor. Senors, you are mistaken about there being an antidote and a poison. It is one medicine only, one little compound, a vegetable substance, Senor Bell, combined with a product of modern chemistry. It is a synthetic drug. Modern chemistry is a magnificent science, and my little medicine is its triumph. Even my deputies have not heard me speak so, senores. Bell snarled wordlessly. But if one had noticed his eyes, they would have seemed to be curiously cool and alert and waiting. The master leaned forward and for once spoke seriously, almost reverently. There shall be a forward step, senores, in the race of men. Do you know the difference between the brain of a man and that of an anthropoid ape? It consists only of a filmy layer of cortex, a film of gray nerve cells which the ape has not. And that little layer creates the difference between ape and man. And I have discovered more. My little medicine acts upon that film. Administered in the tiny quantities I have given to my slaves, it has no perceptible effect. It is merely a compound of a vegetable substance and a synthetic organic base. It is not excreted from the body. Like lead, it remains always in solution in the blood. But in or out of the blood, it changes, always, to the substance which causes murder madness. Fresh or changed, my little medicine acts upon the brain. He smiled brightly upon them. But though in tiny quantities it has but little effect, in larger quantities, when fresh, it makes the functioning of the gray cells of the human brain as far superior to the unmedicated gray cells as those human gray cells are to the white cells of the ape. That is what I have to offer to the human race, intelligence for every man, which shall be as the genius of the past. He laughed softly. Think, senors. Compare the estate of men with the estate of apes. Compare the civilization which will arise upon the earth 
when men's brains are as far above their present level as the present level is above the anthropoid. The upward step of the human race under my rule will parallel, will surpass the advance from the brutish cavemen to intellectual genius. But I have seen, senors, the one danger in my offering. There was silence. Jameson shook his head despairingly. The master could not see him. He formed the word with his lips. Crazy? Bell said coldly, Go on. I must rule, said the master soberly. It is essential. If my little secret were known, intelligence would be magnified, but under many flags and with many aims. Scientists, which genius beside which Newton pales, would seek out deadly weapons of war. The world would destroy itself of its own genius. But under my rule... Men go mad, said Bell coldly. The master smiled reproachfully. Ah, you are trying to make me angry, so that I will betray something. You are clever, Senor Bell. With my little medicine, in such quantities as I would administer it to you. You describe it, said Bell harshly and dogmatically, as a brain stimulant, but it drives men mad. To be sure, said the master mildly, it does. It is not excreted from the body, save very, very slowly. But it changes in the bloodstream. Ah, let us say, sugar changes into alcohol in digestion. The end product of my little medicine is a poison which attacks the brain. But the slightest bit of unchanged medicine is an antidote. It is, he smiled amiably, it is as if sugar in the body changed to alcohol and alcohol was a poison. But sugar unchanged was an antidote. That is it, exactly. You see that I have taken my medicine for years, and it has not harmed me. Which, said Bell, and somehow his manner made utter silence fall, so that each word fell separately into a vast stillness, which, thank God, is the one thing that wins finally for me. He stood up and laughed, quite a genuine laugh. Paula, he said comfortably, get on the plane, in the cabin. Jameson and I are going to strip the master. Paula stared. The master looked at him blankly. Jameson frowned bewilderedly, but stood up grimly to obey. But, senor, said the master, in gentle dignity, merely to humiliate me? Not for that, said Bell. He laughed again. But all the time I've been hearing about the stuff, I've noticed that nobody thought of it as a drug. It was a poison. People were poisoned. They did not become addicts. But you, you are the only addict to your drug. He turned to Jameson, his eyes gleaming. Jameson, he said softly, did you ever know a drug addict who could bear to think of ever being without a supply of his drug right on his person? Jameson literally jumped. By God, no! The master was quick. He was swarming up the plain wingtip before Jameson reached him, and he kicked frenziedly when Jameson plucked him off. But it was wholly, entirely, utterly horrible that the little white-haired man, whose face and manner had seemed so cherubic and so bland, should shriek in so complete a blind panic as they forced his fingers open and took a fountain pen away from him. This is it, said Bell in deep satisfaction. This is his point of weakness. The master was ghastly to look at now. Jameson held him gently enough, considering everything, but the master looked at the fountain pen as one might look at paradise. I, I swear, he gasped, I swear I will give you the formula. You might lie, said Jameson grimly. I swear it, panted the master in agony. If, if the formula is known, it can be duplicated. It, the excretion, can be hastened. It can all be forced from the body, simply, so simply. If only you know, I will tell you how it is done. The medicine is the cacodylate of... Bell was leaning forward now, like a runner breasting the tape at the end of a long and exhausting race. I'll trade, he said softly, half the contents of the pen for the formula. 
The other half will need for analysis. Half the stuff in the pen for the formula for freeing your slaves. The master sobbed. A, a pencil, he gasped, I swear. Jameson gave him a pencil and a notebook. He wrote, his hands shaking. Jameson read inscrutably. It doesn't mean anything to me, he said soberly, but you can read it. It's legible. Bell smiled faintly. With steady finger, he took his own fountain pen from his pocket. He emptied it of ink and put a scrupulous half of milky liquid from the master's pen into it. He passed it over. Your medicine, said Bell quietly, may taste somewhat of ink, but it will not be poisonous. Now, what do we do with you? I give you your choice. If we take you with us, you will be held very secretly as a prisoner until the truth of the information you have given us can be proven. And if your slaves have all been freed, then I suppose you will be tried. The master was drawn and haggard. He looked very, very old and beaten. I would prefer, he said dully, that you did not tell where I am, and that you go away and leave me here. I, I may have some subjects who will search for me, and they may discover me here. But I am beaten, senor. You know that you have won. Bell swung up on the wing of the plane. He explored about in the cabin. He came back. There are emergency supplies, he said coldly. We will leave them with you and such things as may be useful to allow you to hope as long as possible. I do not think you will ever be found here. I prefer it, senor, said the master dully. I will catch fish. Jameson helped put the packages ashore. The master shivered. Bell stripped off his coat and put it on top of the heap of packages. The master did not stir. Bell laid a revolver on top of his coat. He went out to the plane and started the motors. The master watched apathetically as the big seaplane pulled clumsily out of the little cove. The rumble of the engines became a mighty roar. It started forward with a rush, skimmed the water for two hundred yards or so, and suddenly lifted clear to go floating away through the air toward the north. Paula was the only one who looked back. He's crying, she said uncomfortably. It isn't fear, said Bell quietly. It's grief at the loss of his ambition. It may not seem so to you, too, but I believe he meant all that stuff he told me. He was probably really aiming in his own way for an improved world for men to live in. The plane roared on. Presently Bell said shortly, That stuff he has won't last indefinitely. I'm glad I left him that revolver. Jameson stirred suddenly. He dug down in his pocket and fished out a cigar. Since I feel that I may live long enough to finish smoking this, he observed dryly, I think I'll light it. I haven't felt that I had twenty minutes of life ahead of me for a long time now, and a sense of economy made me smoke cigarettes. It wouldn't be so much waste if you left half a cigarette behind when you were killed. The tight little cabin began to reek of the tobacco. Paula pressed close to Bell. But Charles, she asked hopefully, is, is it really all right now? I think so, said Bell, frowning. Our job's over, anyhow. We go up the Chilean coast and find that Navy boat. We turn our stuff over to them. They'll take over the task of seeing that every doctor everywhere in South America knows how to get the master's poison out of the system of anybody who's affected. Some of them won't be reached, but most of them will. I looked at his formula. Standard drugs, all of them. There won't be any trouble getting the news spread. The master slaves will nearly go crazy with joy. And he added grimly, I'm going to see to it that the real police take back what they said about us. I think we'll have enough pull to demand that much. He was silent for a moment or so, thinking. I do think, Jameson, he said presently, we did a pretty good job. Jameson grunted. If, if it's really over, said Paula hopefully, Charles. What? You will be able to think about me sometimes, asked Paula wistfully, instead of about the master always. Bell stared down at her. 
Good Lord, he groaned, I have been a brute, Paula, but I've been loving you. He stopped and then said, with the elaborate politeness and something of the customary idiotic air of a man making such an announcement, I say, Jameson, did you know Paula and I were to be married? Jameson snorted. Then he said placidly, No, of course not. I never dreamed of such a thing. When did this remarkably original idea occur to you? He puffed a huge cloud of smoke from his cigar. It was an unusually vile cigar. Bell scowled at him helplessly for a moment and then said wrathfully, Oh, go to hell. And he bent over and kissed Paula. End of chapter 18 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas End of Murder Madness by Murray Leinster